This is part one of a series on neonatal physiology. As indicated, this session will focus on neonatal circulation. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Arguably, the most significant aspect of neonatal physiology is the transition from fetal circulation to a normal extrauterine circulation. This illustration demonstrates normal fetal circulation, but I am going to call on my rudimentary artistic abilities in an effort to make it clearer. This is a schematic representation of adult circulation. Hopefully the cardiac chambers and great vessels need no explanation. In contrast, this is a schematic of the normal fetal circulation. Note the presence of the foramen ovale. This is essentially a one-way valve that permits blood to flow from the right atrium into the left atrium. Next, note the presence of the ductus arteriosus. This is a vessel that would permit flow in either direction. In utero, the pressure in the pulmonary artery is greater than the pressure in the aorta, so blood flows from the pulmonary artery into the aorta, that is, right to left. Note the presence of the placenta between the aorta and the inferior vena cava. The placenta is, is perfused by two umbilical arteries. Blood from the placenta th flows through a single umbilical vein and through the liver via the ductus venosus before entering the inferior vena cava. Fetal blood is oxygen oxygenated in the placenta and blood from the placenta in the umbilical vein is the best oxygenated blood in the fetus. Blood from the umbilical vein enters the inferior vena cava where it joins venous blood from the lower extremities resulting in a decrease in oxygenation. Blood from the inferior vena cava enters the right atrium where it is preferentially directed through the foramen ovale into the left atrium. Because there is very little blood flow through the lungs, there is a minimal reduction in oxygenation when blood flowing through the foramen ovale mixes with blood from the pulmonary veins. From the left atrium, blood enters the left ventricle and is pumped into the aorta. This illustration demonstrates the relationship of the ductus venosus to the vessels in the aortic arch. Under most circumstances, the ductus attaches to the aortic arch in proximity to the left subclavian artery. This is important because if the ductus attaches between the left subclavian and the left common carotid arteries, blood sampled from the left upper extremity or a pulse oximeter placed on the left upper extremity will sample postductal blood, that is, blood with a lower oxygen concentration. It's also important because as the ductus venosus atrophies, it becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. This then becomes a point of fixation of the aorta, resulting in the area being a common site for aortic injuries in deceleration injuries. From the left atrium, blood enters the left ventricle and is pumped into the aorta. Given the relationship of the ductus arteriosus to the aortic arch vessels, blood from the left ventricle preferentially perfuses the brain via the brachiocephalic and left common carotid arteries. This results in blood perfusing the brain having a higher oxygen content than blood in the descending aorta. As will become evident shortly, blood flowing through the ductus arteriosus has a lower oxygen content and, depending on the presence of the location of the ductus, may contribute to perfusion of the left upper extremity via the left subclavian artery. After perfusing the brain, Blood from the upper body returns to the heart via the superior vena cava and enters the right atrium. This blood preferentially enters the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, blood is pumped into the main pulmonary artery. Because of the high pulmonary vas resistance, the majority of the blood entering the pulmonary artery flows through the ductus arteriosus and perfuses the lower portion of the body. Now let's trace the course of blood from the descending aorta and see how oxygen saturation changes. Blood in the descending aorta is about 60% saturated. After perfusing the placenta, 
the blood has a saturation of about 70%. As previously noted, blood in the umbilical vein is the best oxygenated blood in the body. Blood returning via the SVC is about 40% saturated. Mixing of the oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein with blood from the vena cava results in a saturation of 55% in the right atrium. But streaming of blood from the inferior vena cava across the foramen ovale results in a saturation in the left atrium of 65%. Note that this increase in oxygen saturation in the left atrium is all due to shunting through the foramen ovale. Because no oxygenation occurs in the fetal lung, the saturation of blood in the pulmonary vein is the same as the saturation in the right atrium, right ventricle, and pulmonary artery, 55%. The blood with a saturation of 65% from the left atrium enters the left ventricle and is pumped into the aorta where it perfuses the brain preferentially. In contrast, blood from the right ventricle with a saturation of 55% is pumped into the pulmonary artery and the majority of it flows through the ductus arteriosus to enter the aorta, resulting in a saturation of 60% distal to the junction of the ductus arteriosus with the aorta. The final step of assessing fetal circulation is to look at the distribution of cardiac output. 40 to 45 percent of the combined ventricular output flows through the umbilical arteries, is oxygenated in the placenta, and then returns via the ductus venosus to the inferior vena cava. This combines with the 24 percent of combined ventricular output which perfuses the lower body and returns via the inferior vena cava. An additional 20% of combined ventricular output enters the right atrium from the superior vena cava. Almost one-third of the blood entering the right atrium flows through the foramen of alley into the left atrium where it combines with a small volume of blood returning from the lungs via the pulmonary vein. The end result is that only about a third of the combined ventricular output enters the left ventricle. Approximately two-thirds of the blood ejected from the left ventricle goes to perfuse the head and the coronary circulation. Obviously, this is advantageous because this blood is better oxygenated than after it mixes with blood flowing through the ductus arteriosus. Shifting back to the right ventricle, notice that about two-thirds of the combined ventricular output enters the right ventricle, but almost 90% of that flows through the ductus arteriosus to enter the aorta. Less than 10% of the combined ventricular output flows through the pulmonary circulation. In the final analysis, approximately 70% of the combined ventricular output enters the descending aorta with approximately two-thirds of the, that amount, or 45% of the combined ventricular output, flowing through the umbilical arteries to the placenta where it is oxygenated. The remainder perfuses the lower portion of the body. Most of the aspects that make the fetal circulation unique can be attributed to two phenomena. First, the placenta is a large arteriovenous fistula. This results in a very low systemic vas resistance. Since blood flow through the ductus arteriosus is largely dependent on the pressure differences, the low SVR results in a low aortic pressure and blood flows right to left from the pulmonary artery into the aorta. The second phenomenon is that the pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. This further increases the pressure differential favoring blood flow from the pulmonary artery into the aorta via the ductus arteriosus. In addition, it decreases pulmonary blood flow as evidenced by the fact that less than 10% of the combined ventricular output flows through the pulmonary circulation. The high right atrial pressure due to the fact that almost 90% of the combined ventricular output enters the right atrium, combined with the low left atrial pressure, due to the fact that less than 10% of the combined ventricular output enters the left atrium from the pulmonary veins, facilitates right-to-left blood flow through the foramen ovale. It is also worth noting that pressures on the right side of the heart, 
both right atrial and right ventricular systolic and diastolic pressures are also increased as a result of the elevated pulmonary vas resistance. At the same time, left-sided pressures are decreased because of the low systemic vascular resistance resulting from the AV fistula created by the placenta. The fetal circulation is dramatically impacted by two things that occur at birth. First, the umbilical cord is cross-clamped. This results in an immediate increase in systemic vascular resistance and aortic pressure. The decrease in aortic pressure results in a decreased flow through the ductus arteriosus, which, as you recall, was largely due to the difference in pressure between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Another consequence of the umbilical cross clamp is that blood flow in the inferior vena cava is reduced, so venous return to the right atrium is also reduced and right atrial pressure is decreased. The second fundamental event that occurs at birth is that the neonate takes a breath resulting, resulting in air entering the lungs. This results in a rapid decrease in pulmonary vas resistance, which has two effects. First, a decrease in pulmonary artery pressure, which further minimizes the pressure difference between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. In addition, pulmonary blood flow increases, thereby increasing left atrial pressure. This, combined with the decreased right atrial pressure, results in the left atrial pressure exceeding right atrial pressure and functional closure of the foramen ovale. The previously described changes occur in most term births. They are less likely to occur in the presence of prematurity, especially in circumstances of extreme prematurity. Even if the changes do occur in the normal manner, there is the potential for reversion to fetal circulation. Hypoxemia, hypercarbia, and hypothermia can produce increased pulmonary vas resistance, which results in elevated pulmonary artery pressure decreased pulmonary blood flow, which exacerbates hypoxemia, and right to left shunting through the ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale. One of the problems in this circumstance is that decreased pulmonary blood flow results in further hypoxemia, which exacerbates the problem. In the OR, it is also important to note that systemic hypotension may result in right to left shunting through the ductus, which, as previously noted, is associated with worsening hypoxemia and further increases in pulmonary vas resistance. Other factors associated with persistent fetal circulation include prematurity, pulmonary disease, and congenital heart disease. Acidosis, sepsis, and prolonged stress are also associated with a return to fetal circulation. In conclusion, the primary manifestations of fetal circulation are the right to left shunning through the ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale. These are largely consequences of the very low pulmonary blood flow due to elevated pulmonary vas resistance and the low systemic vas resistance occurring as a result of the placenta, which is where oxygenation occurs. Clamping the umbilical cord results in an immediate increase in systemic vas resistance. Filling the lungs with air results in a decrease in pulmonary vas resistance. These changes result in functional closure of the ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale, with consequent decreases in right to left shunting at both levels. Although the foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus are functionally closed, certain factors may cause an increase in pulmonary vas resistance which in turn results in a reversion to fetal circulation. Adherence to the old advice from consultants to, quote, avoid hypotension and hypoxia, unquote, will limit the likelihood of this occurrence. This is the end of the section on neonatal cardiovascular physiology. Thank you for your time. I hope you find it helpful.